Welcome to ATR 387, Examination of Orthopedic and Athletic Injuries in the Lower Extremity. The purpose of this online lecture will be to provide you with the basic definitions of evidence-based practice so that we're all on the same page and then hopefully to begin to lay the foundation for teaching you how to form an evidence-based clinical question that you will use to write your critical appraisal topic in this particular course. I also hope that from this online lecture, you would gain a greater understanding of the value and the role of evidence-based practice in allied healthcare. Uh, what's interesting to me is that hundreds, if not thousands of orthopedic examination techniques and special tests are described in the literature, but they're also described in the textbook that's required for this course. And so one of the important things that always comes to mind for me as a clinician is which of these special tests or techniques really is best suited for the patient that is sitting in front of me. And the other question that I always have is does every known orthopedic special test or test need to be performed on each patient? And you'll find that through this process of evidence-based practice that the answer is, is absolutely no. Um, and so when we think about evidence-based practice and its role and its value, I really say that evidence-based practice principles are really used as a framework to help improve not only the precision of your evaluation techniques, but also the efficiency of the diagnostic process and the evaluation process as well. So I'm looking forward to the this online lecture series, believe it or not. Before we, we can begin to talk about the steps um, of evidence-based medicine and how to apply or integrate evidence-based medicine into our clinical practice, we kind of have to start with the baseline definitions. I know, kind of boring, but we have to start somewhere. And so we'll start with um, the father of evidence-based medicine, or I would call the guru of evidence-based medicine, and that's really Dr. David Sackett. Uh, Dr. David Sackett was uh, a clinician, specifically a physician, uh, who practiced evidence-based medicine and was one of the first to uh, incorporate and integrate evidence-based medicine into his practice. Um, and so he was also one of the first to um, create and publish what is called the Oxford Center for Evidence-Based Medicine, which is an, uh, a website that we will use uh, and consult very often in this class. And it pretty much provides step-by-step um, instructions on how to integrate evidence-based uh, medicine into any clinical practice. So that could be athletic training, that could be personal training, uh, it could be something uh, like nursing, um, or even if you're a physician or an aspiring physical therapist as well. So evidence-based medicine, what is the definition, right? Uh, evidence-based medicine, we I guess Dr. Sackett would define it as this conscientious, explicit, and judicious use of the current best evidence. And if I could add in my definition of what current best evidence is, I would say that it's, it would represent any research article that you could find within the last three to five years. What we know as clinicians, right, is that um, things are constantly changing. Treatments are constantly changing. Re Rehabs are constantly changing, and so is the type of patient that we are seeing in our clinics as well. So everything's always evolving, so it's always important that if you really want to be current, you're looking at research within the last three to five years, right? Um, and so we would look at that current best evidence, and we would really use it to drive our, uh, our clinical decisions or um, drive how we uh, treat our patients in our, in our clinics, right? Um, and then we would say that if we're practicing evidence-based medicine, that would mean that we're integrating our individual clinical expertise, right? Or years of clinical experience. And we're taking that years of clinical experience and we're coupling that with the be best external clinical evidence. Um, and we do that by systematically searching the literature and using probably the, um, the most rigorous research articles, so randomized control trials, systematic reviews to drive our clinical decision making. Now, we would hope that by making this conscientious, explicit, um, judicious use of the current current best evidence and integrating that into our clinical practice, we would hope that it would truly improve uh, patient outcomes um, and hopefully also improve patient satisfaction as well. So evidence-based practice is the integration of um, these three components that you see um, on the screen in front of you. Um, the first component is clinical expertise. The second component is the best research evidence. So you incorporating the best research evidence into your clinical decision-making um, and then patient values and preferences. So let's define 
um, or start with clinical expertise first since we're all clinicians um, listening to this video right now. We would say that clinical expertise refers to the uh, clinician's accumulated um, years of experience. Uh, it also refers to your uh, clinical skills, but then it also has another component to it, and that component is um, the clinician's years of, of education, right? And so why would education be an important component to evidence-based practice? Well, in order to really truly um, incorporate evidence-based medicine into your practice, you have to be able to um, search uh, the literature for the best research evidence. And, and part of being able to search the literature really has to do with whether or not you've learned how to do that over time. And so the best research evidence um, is this idea that um, you would take all of the literature that you found as it relates to a certain treatment um, or rehabilitation technique um, or therapy that you'd want to use with a particular patient, that you would appraise that literature and then you would apply it to that specific patient population with the idea that you would improve um, patient outcomes, right? And so we look at clinical expertise, years of clinical experience, the clinician's clinical skill, the clinician's ability to really truly um, consult the best literature um, available and to apply that literature to um, their patient, right? And so we kind of have to be concerned with patient values and patient preferences, right? What is What, what does that mean? What it means is what, what does the patient bring to the encounter? Um, well, when we think about it, they, they have their own values, they have their own concerns, every patient is very unique. They're also going to bring with them a level of expectation, right? Uh, the expectation for treatment might be different um, when you move from one patient to another. And for sure, every patient is going to have a different set of values, right? Um, when you start applying evidence-based practice um, or evidence-based medicine into your practice, one of your biggest concerns really should be with patient satisfaction, right? Are they happy with the treatment that you just uh, delivered? Are they feeling improvements? Um, or are they seeing improvements in therapy, in treatment, in their rehab, um, as you're starting to incorporate these new techniques um, that you've just researched? So again, evidence-based practice really has three um, components or is the integration of three components and that is your the clinical expertise or the level of experience of the clinician um, the clinician's ability to really truly research um, and search the literature and find the most rigorous research articles and then the clinician's ability to truly um, take into account the patient's values and preferences and to really ask the patient about their level of satisfaction as it relates to the implementation of evidence-based medicine um, into their clinical practice. So now what we'll do is we'll kind of talk about um, the different steps that are involved in um, incorporating evidence-based medicine into your clinical practice. And we're kind of going to dissect these steps in separate modules. So the first module that we're gonna talk about or that we will explore first um, and the first step in the evidence-based medicine um, process is um, the ability to ask clinical a clinical question, right? Um, and so I feel like this this um, figure kind of leaves out the patient. Um, it truly, step one A is the patient walking into your clinic, right? Or a group of patients walking into your clinic um, with a similar pathology or injury or illness, right? That then leads you to ask um, a clinical question: Why does this set a patient have this injury or this illness? What happened to this patient to make them rupture their ACL? So you start asking the clinical question, right? Um, and, and the clinical question is probably the most pivotal part of evidence-based practice. And the reason it's the most pivotal part of, of, of evidence-based practice is because it really truly is the foundation for um, the research articles that you are going to find as you search search the literature. So number one, step number one, we really be, have to be cognizant of is that we're asking important questions about the care of our patients, individuals, communities, um, or and or populations. And we'll dive deeper 
um, into this in the actual module itself. And so once we've asked or we've defined or we've written or created an answerable clinical question, the next thing to do would be to um, acquire the best evidence and we would do that through um, searching the literature, right? And so in module two, we'll talk about how, which search terms we're going to use uh, and which search terms would yield the best research articles. And then we'll talk about quality of research articles, right? Randomized control trials versus a, a case control study, right? Which of these research articles should we be using to change and drive um, our clinical our clinical practice. Uh, and then step three, what we want to do once we've really um, searched the literature and we have a group of articles is to appraise those articles, right? Um, and that goes hand in hand with acquiring um, which articles are more rigorous, which ones are we going to throw out, which ones are we going to use um, for the treatment of this patient um, that's in front of us. And then after we've decided which articles we're going to use, to me, the most important piece to evidence-based medicine then is applying what we found in the research uh, to the patient sitting in front of us. And then last but not least, once we apply this new treatment um, or this new rehabilitation technique um, or this new drug therapy to our patient, we really want to know, was it effective? Did we improve patient outcomes? Um, and if so, then we want to continue to, to use this treatment. And if not, then we kind of have to reassess. Um, and it might lead us to, guess what? Re-ask the clinical question, reacquire new research articles, reappraise, reapply, and reassess. And so when I think about the process of evidence-based practice, it's cyclical. It's, it's this ever evolving process where the clinician is constantly, constantly learning. Um, but I also like to say that when we look at evidence-based practice and when we really dive deep into evidence-based practice, that it really is, it was put into place to um, improve the quality of care of, of our patients, but also to improve accountability for us as healthcare um, practitioners. And what it does is it really creates this environment of, of lifelong learning, right? Where, okay, this, this treatment didn't, re, didn't work. We need to reassess. We need to ask another clinical question. We need to go back into the literature. And so really what I like, what gets me excited is that we become lifelong learners. So as we, um, in this introduction, what I would leave you with again is um, this figure right here where evidence-based practice is the integration of clinical expertise, the best research evidence available, um, and then patient values and preferences. And then what I would say is that um, when, we, when we integrate these three components, what it really truly should do is um, it's going to drive your clinical decisions. It's going to enhance the, um, the treatment um, of, of your patients, which would hopefully improve clinical outcomes and more importantly, improve your patient's quality of, of life. Um, and then I would say that, you know, one of the things about evidence-based practice is it may not be intuitive or maybe maybe it is, but it definitely requires a different skill set, right? Um, and so you, you, you may find that you're a little uncomfortable in this process, but that it, it becomes easier as you as you do it more. It becomes um, it becomes something that's innate, um, and so we have to remember we have to be able to search the liter. We have to be able to ask the question. We have to be able to search the literature. Then we have to be able to um, appraise that literature, apply it to our patient, and then reassess based on on patient outcomes. Thank you for watching and listening to this online lecture. The next topic we will discuss will be on forming the clinical question. During this lecture, you will learn the components that make up a well-formed clinical question, and I will also go through a clinical scenario to teach you guys how to build a clinical question from the ground up. See you in class.